everybody, Zach again, NewTutorial.com, coming in and making a video for you today. Uh, the video we did recently where it talked about Christians coming to the light and the light being Torah. And this is why so many people are coming to the knowledge of Torah. It's because Torah is described in your Bible as light. The Messiah is light. The Torah is light. They're one and the same. And when you search, it says, if you seek, you will find. If you're looking for the light, you're going to find Torah. This is why so many people, and there was a lot of response. I mean, uh, just an enormous amount of response to that video. And um, a lot of response from people who were still in the Christian mindset and who don't understand what it is I'm talking about here. <laughs> and so they provide a whole bunch of arguments, arguments we've all heard before, arguments that I've done lots of videos about previously. You can find them in my playlist, uh, mostly in Romans and Galatians. And so uh, one commenter left a comment and was really laying out a bunch of different arguments, one after another. And I kind of wanted to read that on a video. So let's go ahead. It's going to be a kind of a little bit of a longer video than normal. So let's go ahead, read the comment, and I'm going to try to quickly address these as quickly as possible. Let's get started. My problem with the Torah movement is best described by Egg Shen in Big Trouble in Little China. Interesting. Of course, the Chinese mix everything up. Look at what they have to work with. There's Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoist, alchemy, and sorcery. We take what we want and we leave the rest. Just like your salad bar. The Torah movement does the same, but with the Torah. How many in the Torah movement will write out a complete copy of the Torah, Deuteronomy 31 through 19? From looking around, zero. Zero people say, zero people who say they will follow the law actually follow the law. Fewer, further few ever go camping for the Feast of Booths, Leviticus 23, verse 42. There are 613 laws. Most never implement the stickier laws like talk, taking a brother's wife to impregnate her, Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, or stone their child for being lazy, Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. Heck, I doubt people go out of their way to make sure they are not wearing clothes with two fabrics, Deuteronomy 22, verse 11. Keep in mind, I'm not making a straw man by pulling laws that can't be done while there's no temple. The Torah movement also fails to see the dichotomy in the law for sojourners and Jews. I put Christians in the sojourners group because the church does not replace the Jews. We Christians are only grafted in and can be grafted out just as easily. A Jew could not eat anything found dead, Leviticus 22, verse 8. However, they could sell it to the sojourner, Deuteronomy 14, verse 21. This meant due to rigor and the animal could not be bled and Yah couldn't get the blood. If we step back even further, God doesn't keep kosher, Exodus 23, verse 19, no meat and milk. Genesis 16, 18, he, Abraham, then brought some curds and milk uh, and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them, God and his two companions. While they ate God and his two companions, he stood near them under a tree. Finally, in Acts 15, we have the letter to the Gentiles. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours to put no greater burden on you than these necessary things, that you abstain from food, offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Presumed is the teachings of Jesus that must be followed. There is a clear distinction between Gentiles and Jews as pertains to the law. Both groups are required to follow Jesus' teachings. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these, Mark 12. The Jews, I think, have to follow it since it's part of their familiar oath. Gentiles don't. Ultimately, we have to agree with James. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. James 2.10. Pick your burden. I'll stay with Jesus, for it is light. Matthew 11.30. P.S. As to Christian celebrations, I've heard from the Torah movement that it's not. this is not an approved holiday. Therefore, no one should celebrate it. The thing is that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, John 10.22-24, which is not an approved holiday either. And that was written by Always Looking Around. A uh, comment left on my video uh, about uh, the light and Christians coming to Torah. So, first off, we need to address this whole thing about the Jews and the Gentiles and or sojourners. Okay, <laughs> this is the this this is something that I had never heard about in the Bible. Uh, never until I read it, until I looked at it. Uh, people don't understand that there are two houses to Israel. One is Judah. And the other is Israel, and became known as the house of Israel, otherwise sometimes called the house of Joseph or the house of Ephraim. Okay, two houses. All throughout your Bible, I've done videos on this. All the times it's mentioned in your Bible about the two houses, it's innumerable. It's so often. Once you see it, you're like, how did I not see this before? Over and over and over and over and over again. Two houses. 
There's no such thing anywhere in your Old Testament where it calls this law the Jewish law or the law for the Jews. It's not there. This is not a law for the, this is a, a law. The Torah is for Israel, which was separated into two houses, one named Judah, who became known as Judea, and then, you know, who retained their identity. And then the northern kingdom, the northern house, the house of Israel, otherwise called the house of Joseph or called the house of Ephraim, they got conquered by Assyria and scattered into the nations and they lost their identity. And who did the Messiah say he came for? I am not come, but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that northern kingdom, that kingdom that got separated and lost their identity, got scattered out into the nations. That's the whole point of the fullness of the Gentiles comes in because we will look like Gentiles. And then one day we're going to be like, oh, this whole Torah thing. This is God's commandments. This is what tells us what sin is. I had not known sin, but by the law, Paul says. Paul is speaking to those who were once called Israel, who were once part of the tree, who got cut off and are now grafted in again. So don't, I understand. He's talking about the whole grafting in. He doesn't understand there's two houses here. I am not come, but for the lost sheep, the lost sheep, the ones that lost, didn't know who they were anymore, of the house of Israel. And you look back to the prophets, and all the prophets are talking about is, how will God restore the ruin? How will God bring these two houses back together and make them into one nation? And Ezekiel talks about making the two sticks into one in his hand. One is named Judah, and the other one is named Ephraim. Again, the house of Israel, otherwise known as the house of Joseph or house of Ephraim. It was the larger of the two kingdoms, north and south. Okay, <laughs> But people don't understand this. This is the whole story of the prodigal son. The younger son, the younger, the, 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 the northern house of Joseph goes out amongst the nations, gets scattered, loses their identity, plays the harlot, and Judah is still back in the house. And, you know, if you've talked to a lot of Jews, they're not so happy about some of this Torah movement stuff going on around the world. All these people saying that they're going to follow the ways of Moses. No, 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 that's for the Jews and Jews only. It's the parable of the prodigal son. Where, is he, where does the prodigal son find himself when he realizes he messed up eating with the pigs. Let's move on. On to your other arguments. All right, when it comes to writing out the law, uh, the verse you quoted, Deuteronomy 31, verse 19, was for the song that Moses was commanded to write down for the children of Israel, and he completes that, he fulfills that in verse 22. It has nothing about, about, to do about writing out the Torah. Nothing to do with all. There's no commandment that says you have to write out the Torah. Again, the, the verse you quote in verse 31, 19 was for the song, and he does it in verse 22. He, can, he fulfills what he's been commanded to do. Now, there is a commandment for kings to write out the Torah because it makes sense. If you're going to be king, if you're going to rule over people, you should know the law in which you're ruling them over with. Okay, so the king was to write out the Torah. Every king was supposed to write out a copy of the Torah. However, you say you don't know anybody doing this. I know lots of people doing it. I've even started doing it. I have a whole, I have, I have a whole, there's a whole leaf here of Jim, my first Genesis page. I'm, I'm writing out the Torah. A lot, this is sheepskin. Um, lots of people, I see people going to the, the market and just buying, you know, notebooks and writing out the Torah themselves. Because the one way you can absolutely familiarize yourself, yourself with a topic is to write it out by hand. And so a lot of people know that and they're doing it. I know lots of people who have written out the Torah. Lots. You know, I'm doing it. Lots of people, but it's not commanded. Don't ma don't pretend that this is a commandment that no one's doing. Um, this was commanded only for kings. Kings were supposed to do this so that they would know the law in which they're ruling their people with. Okay, moving on to the next one. You say further few do Sukkot. Further few do Sukkot. That's crazy. Have you have you been living under a rock? There's so many giant Sukkots. I remember when I first came into the knowledge of Torah and we moved out here, there was really one Sukkot around the country that had like a thousand people. And that was like the Monte Judah one, I think, um, in Oklahoma. And now there's numerous, several at least, that have over a thousand people every Sukkot who go out and camp, who camp in tents and booths. Lots of people. And I mean, I do a Sukkot event every year here at my place. And it's like filled, when I do the registration online, it's filled up within hours, two or three hours tops. It's filled up. So don't tell me that further few are doing this whole command of camping in tents. I know there are some people who are like, oh, I don't want to camp in tents. Right, you better learn how to do it because this is a rehearsal. <laughs> You're going to be doing it at some point. I won't go into that in this video, but I'm telling you, lots of people are doing it. So I don't know what you're talking about, further few camp and tents. Lots. 
Here in the Ozarks, there's probably two or three just in the Ozarks here. Uh, Sukkot, they have over a thousand people in attendance, camping in tents. So I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, nobody does the brother take his brother's wife thing. Uh, and you quote Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 through 9. Um, understand that this commandment would be rare to begin with, um, especially in today's day. We, you have families, some families who keep Torah, some families who don't. They're in the Christian church. This would be ridiculous. Uh, they would never do this. Um, but back then, even 100 years ago, when families, it was normal for families to have, you know, 10, 15 kids. If a brother died um, without, you know, uh, uh, his his wife bearing a child, um, that was a huge deal. And especially in, in Bible times, the reason why this commandment was given was because this is all about inheritance. What do we do today? Mom and dad get old and we send them off to a nursing home. And then when they get to the nursing home, they eventually die off. We take all their possessions and we sell them and then we go to Vegas. You know, we take their money and spend it. But no, back then you took the inheritance that your parents gave you and you took that upon yourself and you built onto it. You continued to build on that inheritance so you could pass it down to your kids. And so if one of your children died who was married and had not yet uh, bore an heir to pass your inheritance and his inheritance down too, that was a big deal. And we see this in the story of Ruth when uh, Boaz and Ruth come together and they have a baby and that baby is not Ruth's. If you read at the end of the, end of the book of Ruth, that baby that Ruth has bore goes to Naomi for the purpose of inheritance. This is why uh, the, the, the near kinsman redeemer did not want to marry Ruth because he knew that whatever child he bore, part of it, that inheritance would go away to that child. It was, a, it was a monetary loss at that point. Boaz didn't care. Boaz was doing this out of love. It's, inheritance was a huge deal. And so don't, I mean, and, and, and here's the deal, folks. <laughs> I have heard of this happening in the Torah Roots movement. I have heard of this one time happening where uh, a brother died and the other brother, um, I don't know if it was, I don't know what happened there, but I, I just know, I don't know the, all the details, but I heard about it because I get a lot of emails. I get a lot of feedback from a lot of people. I hear about stuff. And I've heard of this happening because th they wanted to keep God's commandments. I have heard of this. It's crazy because of our culture here today. But if you're keeping God's commandments and you want to do what, what he tells you to do, and, and there's a, a lot of shame that comes with not doing them, in this case in particular, Deuteronomy 25, verse 5 through 9. Um, yeah. So um, people won't do the stickier laws. They will. Because we love God first and foremost. Um, stoning children. Now, here's this, this guy. Whoever this guy is, whoever commented on this, has, he, he has reading comprehension problems. Because if you read, this is not about stoning little kids, okay? But people often throw this out. Oh, you mean you're doing this Torah stuff? You want to stone your children. This is not what this is talking about. It says in the verses, in Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, and then onward, it talks about how they bring their child, their, their son, before the elders, and they, talk, they call him a drunk. Guys, if your nine-year-old's a drunk, it's not the nine-year-old that needs to be stoned, it's you. It's an adult child who's lazy, who's a drunk, who's uh, not contributing anything to society, who's a complete and total waste of space, and he's breaking commandments, he's sinning, and nothing you do can get this guy in line. And so, yeah, they get rid of him. Wouldn't that be an amazing concept today? If we can get rid of all the lazy, stupid people who are constantly out there breaking laws, hurting other people, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't our society be a little bit more, you know, enjoyable if we got rid of all the stupid? Right now, stupid doesn't hurt, but stupid should hurt. When a guy goes out and rapes a woman, he goes to prison for a little bit. When a guy goes out and rapes a little girl... He goes to prison for a little bit. No, no, no. See, if we were doing things the way we ought to be doing them, we wouldn't have these idiots in society. And people would think twice about committing those stupid things, committing those stupid acts. Because there'd be consequences. Today, we're living in a world that has no consequences. So this is not talking about children. This is talking about adult people who are entirely a waste of space to their community, who contribute nothing, who are lazy, who are breaking commandments. They are sinning. And... The community decides to do something about it. Moving on. 
Two different fabrics. You mentioned the whole two different fabrics, Deuteronomy 22, verse 11, and Leviticus 19, 19. Guys, this is talking about wool and linen. People always come up, they'll always say, so you're doing this Torah thing. You you don't believe in, I, I, what's your shirt made out of? Is it cotton and and polyester? Well, you're sinning. <laughs> no, no, no. It says specifically wool and linen. Wool and linen. I've actually, we actually went to a, a flea market one time and we actually, we were going through the clothes looking for second, you know, hand-me-downs, whatever. You know, there's good stuff at, at flea markets and stuff like that. And we found a, a shirt that was made with wool and linen. I, I'd never seen one like that, but they do. They make them wool and linen mixed together. God says, don't do that. Don't, he doesn't, you know, most of his commandments, he gives you a reason of why he says, don't do this, or you shall do this, or whatever. He gives some reasons sometimes, but not always. And this is one of the reasons, this is one of the times he doesn't really give a reason. He just says, don't do it. And I mean, that's good enough for me. Don't do it. It has nothing to do with cotton or canvas, which is usually made of cotton, or rayon or silk or polyester or polypropylene or whatever. It has nothing to do with any of that. And you can decide for yourself if those materials are good or not. But what he says is don't mix wool and linen. So don't use the excuse, oh, you're mixing, you're wearing mixed fabrics, you're sinning, you're breaking Torah. No, I'm not. I'm not wearing wool and linen, period. All right, moving on. Uh, God does not keep kosher. He gives the example of Exodus 23, verse 19. Folks, I just did a video on this. This is not about milk and meat. This is about do not cook animals that are still nursing from their mother. This, that's what that's talking about. Do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That's in milk from the mother. This has nothing to do with cheeseburgers. This has nothing to do with some pagan origin of pagans taking an animal and putting it into boiling milk and then casting it over their fields. This is a bunch of nonsense. I prove it in the video. That's nonsense. Whoever's spreading that, nonsense. And the, I know the Jewish tradition of, you know, this means don't eat cheeseburgers. When at Abraham is pointed out by the commenter, clearly ate meat and cheese together, you know, with, with God when he, and the angels when they were there in that, in that chapter, in that verse. So I get it. Um, I get it. It's not, it has nothing to do with cheeseburgers. <laughs> so watch that video. Um, no, bad argument. Uh, Acts 15, this always comes up. Guys, Acts 15 is about one thing and one thing only. Acts 15 is about talking to new believers. This was the pagan Roman Empire. The pagan Roman Empire, where they worshipped all kinds of false gods, they had all kinds of false practices, and all these people were coming in, and the Jews at the time were saying, oh, we got to lop off their junk. And the, the disciples and some of the other people were like, whoa, whoa, before we start lopping off stuff, let's make sure they're really, you know, kind of, you know, willing to do all these things. What, if, what, they're really, what they're really willing to give up. Are they willing to give up their idols in their homes? Are they willing to stop participating in temple prostitution? Are they willing to give up the practice of drinking blood? Are they willing, you know, all of these things, you know, are they willing to start here? And it's the same thing we do in the Christian church today. You know, someone comes in, he has a drinking problem. Let's get out of the bar. Let's start here. Let's get out of the bar. It's where you start because of the culture you're in. And in fact, I have this book, Pubble. It's not a Christian book. This was published by Yale Press. And it talks about the paganism in the Roman Empire. And sure enough, all the things that are listed in Acts chapter 15, those four things were very prominent in the pagan Roman Empire. And so that's why the people, the council in Acts 15 said, let's start here. And in verse 21 of Acts 15, it says, you will learn the rest of Moses as you go along because he's taught every Sabbath day. Start here. These four things. Can you start here? And then Moses as we go. Baby steps. The same thing we do in the churches today. Let's start where we're at. Acts 15 was, and not only that, keep in mind, all those four things that I mentioned in Acts 15, they're all Torah commandments. There's no mention of lying, no mention of stealing, no mention of adultery, no mention of murder. No, no, no. We're going to talk about temple prostitution, drinking blood, animal strength. So I guess I can commit adultery and lie and steal now because, hey, for new believers, those don't matter. Only have to do those four things. It makes no sense. What does make sense is that they were giving instructions in a pagan Roman empire of, for new believers on where to start. That was Acts 15. That was the purpose of Acts 15. Okay, uh, Yeshua's teachings to love God with all their heart and with all in your neighbor as yourself. Folks, this was not new. This was in the Torah. Leviticus 19, verse 18, and Leviticus 19, verse 34. Love your neighbor as 
yourself. Okay, this is not new. Okay, it was new to the people that Yeshua was talking to because in, in their minds, hey, you had to be my flavor of Judaism. Otherwise, you weren't my neighbor. If you were my, if you were a Sadducee who felt the exact same way I did, well, then you were my neighbor. If you were a, a Pharisee who felt the exact same thing, way that I do, then you're my neighbor. But if you're a Samaritan, or if you're a you know sojourner, or a Gentile, whatever, or if you're a Sadducee and I'm a Pharisee, well, then forget you. No, love your neighbor as yourself because you were once strangers in the land of Egypt amongst the pagans. Everyone can be, you can love on everyone. Okay, that's the point that he was trying to take. Uh, and then also James 2.10, you know, the whole thing, you know, Zach, if you break one law, you've broken them all. That's true. That's right. It's called, you're a lawbreaker. That's what he says in, in the verses. No one ever keeps reading the verses because it says, when you break any law, you have sinned and you are now a lawbreaker. You are now a transgressor. It doesn't matter if, if I go out and I run a red light, I'm a transgressor. I'm a lawbreaker. If I go out and I murder somebody, I'm a transgressor. I'm a lawbreaker. So the thing is, when you break Torah, it doesn't matter what part of Torah, when you break Torah, you get that label as transgressor. And that's exactly what James says in James 2. That's what he's talking about in James 2.10. So, but the people will come, well, Zach, you know, if you break one law, you break them all. So don't even try keeping any of them. <laughs> that makes no sense. That's like saying, you know what? If I break one law, I'm a lawbreaker here in our society. I guess I just won't obey any laws. I can just run through red lights. I can kill people. I can do whatever I want because it doesn't matter. <laughs> that makes no sense. <sighs> uh, and then the final argument, Christmas is okay if Hanukkah is okay. Because, Zach, you know, you say not to keep Christmas, but they kept Hanukkah, and that wasn't a required feast. Guys, it was Abraham threw a feast when Isaac was weaned. This is called a miste in the Hebrew. A miste. And it's the same thing. It was a military victory over the Greeks. And at, as such, they had a party. They had a giant party, and it carried on throughout the traditions, out throughout the generations. It's the same thing with 4th of July. We beat the British, and now we celebrate the defeat of the British. July 4th. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's not a required feast. It's not li listen to the... But see, Christmas and Easter are absolutely tied to pagan origins. Pagan, I mean, Christmas, the winter solstice. They worshipped all their gods. You know, the spring equinox. Uh, in springtime, they worshipped all of their uh, false goddesses. Their bare-breasted fertility goddesses. Those two are absolutely tied, Christmas and Easter, to pagan worship. Hanukkah is just a military celebration, a military victory. And I know that some people have taken that and they're using it as Christmas light. They, they, they do a lot of Christmas stuff and they've, they've made it into something that's not in Scripture. I get that. I know the people who do that. They put on Hanukkah sweaters and uh, have Hanukkah bushes and all these things that because they, they want to do Christmas light or Christmas-like events. Eh, forget those weirdos. That's not what scripture says. And yeah, I don't do that stuff either. Most people I know don't do that stuff. But recognizing it for a military holiday, just like Purim did in, in the book of Esther, yeah, it's fine. It's the same story over and over again. They tried to kill all the Jews. They failed. So now let's eat. <laughs> um, so here's the deal. This commenter laid out a bunch of arguments in a quick, short amount of time on why you can't keep the Torah, why you can't keep the law. I have lots of videos on my channel that talk about all these things in detail. Some of them I mentioned here. Some of them are linked in the description below of what I mentioned in this video. Check them out. You test scripture. Test everything to see if you're approved. Be like the Bereans. Look at everything and test. I came from a Southern Baptist background. And I realized one day, whatever they were teaching up at that pulpit wasn't actually in the book. It was a bunch of nonsense. It was a bunch of traditions, traditions and doctrines of men. But see, what I wanted to do was keep the commandments of God. And those who seek, those will be the ones who will find. All right, we'll leave it at that. Go home. Read your Bible. Thanks.